the original Game Boy, Nintendo's first handheld gaming device with interchangeable cartridges. This simple platform featuring a monochrome display was the first of many different handheld gaming devices released by Nintendo to dominate the handheld market, right up until this very day. The Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advance, DS and 3DS have all been champions of their generations respectively. But that hasn't meant that plenty of companies haven't come along in an attempt to dethrone Nintendo of their portable crown. Previously on this channel, in regards to the original Game Boy's generation of competition, we have looked at both the Sega Game Gear and the Atari Lynx. These two handhelds actually had a lot in common. Both in their favour featured full colour graphics, backlit screens and both were more powerful than the Game Boy. However, both failed to take a significant chunk of the Game Boy's market share, partially due to inferior battery lives, arguably weaker libraries of games and retailing at significantly higher price points than that of their Nintendo competition. The message was clear. In this period in time, people were on the whole happier to go with the simple green monochrome Game Boy over its beefier competition, provided that the games were decent, the battery life was good and the price to buy one was fairly cheap. So if the competition couldn't get a big enough slice of the pie by putting out snazzier, more expensive products, what would an alternative way to try and grab a market share be? The answer to this question is simple. Try and replicate the Game Boy's limited capabilities and offer the product to consumers at an even lower price point. Yeah! Let me introduce you to the Waltara Supervision, the Tesco value answer to the Game Boy. This system was brought to my attention for the first time after a friend of mine who watches this YouTube show sent me this unit right here. It is a bit old, battered and beat up, but this system intrigued me as it was a cartridge based handheld I'd never seen before. He even sent me some games for the bloody thing to get me started. My interest was peaked from the start, so it was time to look at this system's history. I first went to my pal Guru Larry, who knows a lot of weird facts about weird things. He is a great person to approach if someone chooses to endeavour on a fact hunt. Needless to say, he was familiar with the product, and even owned one himself. A few years ago, Larry lent his supervision to Ashens for him to review on his channel. This video has since had 450,000 bloody views, turning the completely dismissed supervision into somewhat of a collectible these days. The power of the bloody internet, eh? So yes, Larry and Ashens exposing this little system to such a large audience is a chapter now in this thing's history in its own right I suppose. Still though, the ins and the outs of this platform have never really been discussed on a particularly deep level, so I've put a lot of playtime into this thing and played every single game in the library in an attempt to make judgement on if the supervision is worth playing today. Yeah. Anyway, let me now take you back to 1992. The success of the Game Boy was turning a lot of heads and it was enough to get many companies to take notice. Some of these companies began to speculate on how they could get a piece of the action. One of these speculators was a company known as Waltara. This Taiwanese company came up with the idea to release a product that was slightly better in design than the Game Boy, but at a cheaper price point for the consumer to buy. This was a great alternative way to try and grab that market share. The result of this speculation was the Waltara Supervision. The Waltara Supervision is a monochrome handheld games console, originated from Asia and introduced in 1992 as a cut price competitor for the Nintendo Game Boy. Waltara entered into a distribution deal, which allowed for the Supervision to be priced at only $49.95 which was considerably less than the Nintendo's $89.99 for their Game Boys. The games on the system were extremely cheap, to varying in prices from $8.95 to $14.95. Games for the system were mostly developed in either Hong Kong or Taiwan by Waltara's in-house development team. However, a tiny handful of games were developed by third parties too, such as Satchel. In terms of technical specifications, the Waltara offered a CPU with an 8-bit processor. The Supervision also featured a screen of 2.37 inches by 2.37 inches, which is significantly bigger than that of the Game Boy. 
Like the Game Boy though, the Supervision also uses an LCD that can only display in four monochrome shades. The unit is also powered by four AA batteries or a 6 volt AC DC adapter. On the unit itself, you can find a cartridge port for your games, a contrast dial to make the system easier to play in varied light conditions, and a DB9 connector port for multiplayer. Sand is handled by four tonal and one noise channel plus an additional DMA stereo output channel via the built-in speaker or the headphone jack. So, apart from the much lower price point and the bigger screen, the Supervision had one more trick up its sleeve too. The Wultara also had available a TV link cable on the market. The cable connects the Supervision and a TV link box together, which then plugs the system directly into the television. This allowed the system to act in much the same way as the Nintendo Switch acts today, and even came out quite a few years before that of even the Super Game Boy. So if your impressions of the Supervision were no more than a Game Boy imitation, then think again, Wataro was trying to innovate too. The Supervision's external appearance also had some variations too. The original appearance of the Wataro Supervision was extremely similar to the original Game Boy, even copying the location of the power switch, headphone jacks and the volume and contrast knobs. Personally, I am not a fan of this model as it contradicts my prior points about innovation. However, a second version was released that featured a redesigned D-pad and offered a bendable section in the middle, allowing the screen to be set up at an angle. Small tabs were included on the back to help hold the screen if the supervision was placed on a flat surface. We got this version in the UK too, however for some reason, including on my unit, the back tabs were not included. There was also, apparently, a third version released which lost the bendable section and changed the D-pad once again. The location of the start and select button was also changed and the handheld added raised sections to the front. This version was released in grey, green and yellow. When it came to the marketing of the system, there was a lot of variance in the name of the device too. A bit like the Sega Genesis and the Sega Mega Drive, or the NES and the Famicom. This made the device range from being named the Supervision, the Hypervision and the Tiger Boy. Different global distributors also made the system known as the Vini Supervision or the Videojet Supervision, the Audio Sonic Supervision, the Hartung Supervision, and in my native country of the United Kingdom, the Quickshot Supervision. Other regional differences and something that may only matter to collectors was the box variance between regions. In Europe, the games came in nice cardboard boxes, as most games did over the period really. However, in North America instead, the games came in these stupid plastic clamshells, similar to that of action figures, so basically to open a North American game, you had to destroy the packaging in the process. Despite being a largely odd forgotten console today, surprisingly the Supervision made a fair few television appearances back in the day. In the mid 90s, the Supervision was once offered as a final prize on the television game show Legends of the Hidden Temple and it was also offered as a prize on the premiere of the similarly short-lived The New Price is Right in 1994. And in my country of the United Kingdom, the quick shot version of the Supervision was heavily featured for a time on the ITV gaming show Bad Influence. Presenter Violet Berlin could be seen playing a Supervision in many of the show's publicity photos. Also, if you're wondering what bad influence was, it's an early to mid 90s British factual television program broadcast on CITV between 1992 and 1996. Basically, it was a show that looked at video games and computer technology. I suppose the bad influence part of the name was probably the fact that they were trying to get kids to purchase a Supervision instead of a Game Boy. So, with somewhat of a marketing campaign going on, a rock bottom price point, a large screen and compatibility to play games on the television, what exactly was it that went wrong for the Supervision? Well, reasons that are commonly cited was the poor quality screen which was prone to blurring and made following the action difficult, and overall a general lack of games. As mentioned previously, the majority of the games were developed in Hong Kong and Taiwan, meaning that fans of big name Western and Japanese developers were underwhelmed by the apparent lack of support from these companies, so no Capcom, Konami, Sunsoft or anyone like that making games for the supervision. Just an in-house development team and a couple of minor third parties. 
over the system's entire life cycle, the platform only ever saw around 65 games released on the handheld, which is a meagre amount when compared to that of the Sega Game Gear or Atari Lynx, let alone that of the Game Boy. The second model of the Supervision is also much bigger and less portable than that of the original Game Boy, making it arguably less appealing. It's a bit of a beast really for such a simple device. Apparently the units are also poorly put together too, with reports of users finding tape and cellophane inside the supervisions when dismantling them. Many today are now damaged and are no longer even working. But despite all of this, it is a budget handheld. So if you wanted a cheap handheld, surely going for the supervision was a no-brainer, right? Well, no. Pretty much as soon as the Wutara went to market at $49.95, Nintendo then countered it by offering a Game Boy Basic package for only $59.95. So essentially, you could get a device with all the big name titles by only spending an extra $10. So Wutara's main point of being the bargain bucket handheld was quickly destroyed by Nintendo. So in 1992, it didn't look like the wisest move to have chosen the supervision. The Game Boy with its established library of games had way more upside to it, particularly when the price dropped and it became a budget handheld itself too. But today isn't necessarily about 1992, it's more about 2017. So the only way to really be able to tell if the Supervision is worth playing today is by looking at some of those games. In terms of the games themselves, there really isn't much information available online regarding this one. No decent top 10 lists, no game reviews. With this one, I couldn't find any reference points whatsoever with where to even start. So the only solution? Play every single Supervision game ever released. Time for a research montage. Yeah. That experience was well um, interesting and rather bloody exhausting. But on the bright side, I can now probably have the best perspective on the Supervision Library on the entire bloody planet. Not the most useful subject to be the authority on, I must say, but I am still now the ultimate Supervision Scholar nonetheless. So let's dive in and look at some of the games the Supervision has to offer. As mentioned previously, the majority of the games for the system were developed in Hong Kong and Taiwan, and many of these games actually appear to have a fair amount in common. Essentially on the whole, they are not very good, and all suffer from similar problems. Most of these games are very slow affairs, and most of them suffer from some of the worst ghosting I've ever seen on the platform. Look at all of that bloody sprite flicker. These games made the NES look like it was actually good. Everyone knows in terms of gaming history that the hottest thing on the planet in gaming in the early 90s were mascot platformers. 
For some reason, unbeknownst to myself, the supervision chose not to attempt to cash in on this craze, as the system offers very little in the way of side-scrollers. First, we have Hero Kid, which appears to be a complete knockoff of Wonder Boy and Adventure Island. The difference is though, I cannot appear to get past the first few seconds of gameplay without dying. Basically, the controls are so terrible that I cannot manage to get more than a few steps without tripping over every rocky obstacle, then eventually dying in the fire. Hero Kid appears to be the most dyspraxic gaming mascot of all time, so let's move on. Next up, we have Jackie Lucky. If you have stumbled across this obscure title, one certainly is far from bloody lucky. Basically, imagine Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of AVGN fame, essentially scaled down onto a green monochrome handheld. Jackie Lucky makes the NES game look like Super Mario Brothers. This is how bad this one is. This is the slowest platformer I have ever played, and Jackie even comes equipped with that terrible cane attack also wielded by Mr. Hyde. Christ Ball, which was the system's packing game, isn't too bad. It is essentially just a breakout sort of Arkanoid clone, but the game handles well and there is nothing to complain about really, so in terms of first party games, I can see why they chose this one over a lot of the other tripe which the supervision had to offer. Another game of note, I suppose, was one I found called Chimera. It essentially seemed to play in the same way as a few of my old classic British favourites, such as Head Over Heels, Batman and Monster Max. I'll be honest, I had no idea what I was bloody doing though, but it looked cool nonetheless. My favourite bit was when I got killed by what looks like a fridge, which then screamed like a man. The Supervision also has its own Zelda style RPG. Well, sort of. Delta Attack is like the action RPG version of those terrible platform side-scrollers I mentioned earlier. It's slow, it's flickery, and at the end of the day, as usual, I had no idea what I was doing. So it was like most Supervision games, I suppose. For some reason, the Supervision is absolutely jam-packed with Japanese-style space shooters. I cannot really think of a logical explanation for this, other than the fact that maybe space shooters are easier to program for than other genres of games. All the first party ones suffer from the usual slow supervision flickery crap, however there are a few exceptions. You see, third party developer Satchin surprisingly seem to know about how to program for the supervision. The difference between their games and many others on the system is that most of these games were actually playable. Magin Cross, for example, even starts with a bit of storyline dialogue that transitions into a not flickery R-type style space shooter. Galaxy Fighter and Galactic Crusader both also fare surprisingly well, with limited flicker and a good pace of action. These games even feature interesting boss battles, which is more than can be said for a lot of Supervision games. Sachin also created a number of very good, but completely shameless clones of Game Boy games. Cabby Island, for example, sees you control a Pac-Man style sprite in a pretty solid Bomberman ripoff, complete with all the traditional Bomberman power-ups. John's Adventure, which sounds like a naff platformer, is in fact a really solid Dr. Mario clone. Why they chose to go with the name John's Adventure though is pretty baffling and lacklustre, and doesn't portray what the bloody game is about at all. The decent knockoffs don't end there though. Hash Blocks is a great little clone of Columns, and Blockbuster is a near perfect version of Tetris. To round off my favourite Satchin games on the system, there is also Balloon Fighter, which as the name suggests is a good copy of Balloon Fight, which pretty much deserved ripping off anyway considering that too is just a rip off of bloody joust. Moving on from Satchin, the other major third party developer, if we can use the word major concerning the supervision, was Bond Treasure Company Limited. I personally don't feel that their supervision contributions were quite as good as Satchin, but I suppose they are notable nonetheless. A lot of the games suffer with the same ghosting problems as other titles on the system. The best game I could find out of the Bond Treasure entries was a little game called Police Bust. The game is nothing special really, but I suppose it's a unique Pac-Man clone with its own style and flavour. The music isn't half bad too! So, there you go ladies and gentlemen, a nice big dose of supervision action for all of you. Wataru's attempt at taking some of the Game Boy's market share was somewhat of a logical one, however due to the lacklustre library of games and minimal distribution, the supervision never really ever did manage to make a sizeable dent in the marketplace. 
Even the very best games available on the Supervision are just rip-offs of licensed games already available on the Game Boy. So is the Supervision worth playing today? With this one, I'm going to have to say no this time around. The Supervision is now just a footnote in gaming history, and a footnote is how it should remain really. The Supervision to me was always a tacky yet slightly mysterious system, but now I've played all the games that mystique and intrigue has been successfully eradicated. The main positives to draw from this experience was that I did learn a little bit more about gaming history, and at least I got to play some decent clone games. But after all of this, I'd be perfectly happy for the Supervision to remain as obscure as ever before. Thank you for watching today's video, another platform bites the dust in my quest to review all of the cartridge based handhelds. Tune in next week to see what handheld console I have in store for you all next. Shout outs to Shizuka Kobayashi, Mad 8 Productions, Andrew Bazanski, Pizza Dawn, Mike Frost, Edward O'Reilly and all of my other patrons. You make making content feel so much more worthwhile for me. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and let me all know of any experiences you have had with the Supervision. Click one of the annotations to see one of my previous videos too. Ta-ta and farewell.